hello everyone <laughs> let's welcome professor pankaj chandra uh, please, uh, so please uh, take seat here he is uh, his biggest qualification is that he is our alumnus of 1983 <laughs> and lagta hai ki he roam the same uh, you know college corridors where you been here okay uh, for those who do not know me i am uh, professor ak jain in department of mining i see some of the students probably from the other colleges sir uh, there are about uh, 250 students coming to participate in this uh, event from uh, all mining colleges across india <laughs> so let me uh, and of course we have mr punil bindalesh with us with uh, us he is our alumnus too and he is a professor he is a mining engineer but doesn't look like a mining engineer so he is you know joined in the department of humanistic studies am i right sir yeah okay we normally call it human values we erroneously <laughs> okay so guys uh, you know that uh, professor pankaj chandra is uh, currently vice chancellor of uh, ahmedabad university and he was earlier director iim bangalore and before that uh, he was with iim ahmedabad then uh, i don't know he he is a very large biodata and i have tried to kind of you know put it concisely so uh, in ahmedabad he was professor of operations and technology management and of course he holds uh, this btech in mining engineering and he has a phd from wharton school university of pennsylvania and he has taught at various institutes such as uh, mcgill university in montreal canada university of geneva the wharton school university of pennsylvania international university of japan cornell university renmin university Beijing and I am in the bath, of course. And he has uh, briefly worked with the World Bank in Washington D.C. He was the chairperson of doctoral program at I am in the bath, and the first associate dean academic at I.S.B. Hyderabad. He was part of the founding team at uh, the Center of Innovation, Incubation, and Entrepreneurship at I.A.M. in the bath. and its first chairperson professor chandra has served as member of the government of india committee on clusters for development of the informal sector he was a member of the two high powered committees the government of india committee on rejuvenation of higher education the yashpal committee you might have heard about and that re looked at the indian higher education system as well as the committee on the autonomy of central institutions he was a member of uh, two steering committees constituted by the planning commission of india for 12th plan development one on higher and technical education where he also chaired the sub committee on students financial aid and the other on industry he was a member of uh, central advisory board of education cabe sub committee on teacher education and recently he was also a member of telecom regulatory authority of india okay his research and teaching interests include manufacturing management supply chain coordination building technological capabilities higher education policy and high tech entrepreneurship he was he has published extensively in international referred journals and has served on the editorial boards of several international journals his forthcoming book studies issues of governance change and institution building in indian universities and he has been conducting the national survey on competitiveness of indian manufacturing since the last 20 years professor chandra has involved has been involved in several startups and uh, he has also been a consultant to large indian and multinational firms and serves on the boards and academic councils of several firms and institutions like mind tree bi rsc and id ig idr srishti school of art design and technology film and television institute of india iit jodhpur triple iit bangalore triple iit dharwad and of course bhu 
His recent book is titled Building Universities That Matter, Where Are Indian Institutions Going Wrong? And probably he's going to talk tomorrow on this uh, similar topic in the, our institute lecture series tomorrow 3 p.m. in uh, MP Netravala conference hall in the Department of Mining Engineering. So guys, uh, let me not take any more time. I think uh, this is a, even if it was a short introduction, but uh, you know, probably I don't know, it doesn't give justice, doesn't do justice to whatever he has accomplished in life. And let's draw inspiration from him, and let's interact with him, and ask a lot of questions, whatever comes to your mind. Thank you very much, sir. Please. Please come. So, um, you know, uh, I, I'm a bad role model for mining engineer. So don't follow anything that uh, Professor Jain has been saying because my world and life has been um, just going through one principle, that I have one life to live and I should live it my way. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and, and I, I was mentioning many of these things that you, you heard actually are just coincidences and chances. Uh, there are many chances that come your way and, and, and you will see that in your own life also. <clears throat> and the challenge and the interest is, um, which ones do you grab? It's like you are sitting in a boat doing fishing and there are many fishes which are passing by. And you need to see which is the one that, <clears throat> that, um, that you should angle and caught, catch. Um, and, and my rule, just simple, and it doesn't, it may not necessarily work for everybody, but it has been, catch the one that you like, which is very nice at that moment with the information that you have, because the future is going to be very, very different. And tomorrow I'm going to talk about this whole world of the future of work. Uh, what I see, I mean, it's not necessarily the truth, but what I see <clears throat> kind of happening as far as um, the world of work is concerned and what is the role of universities or if at all is there any role of a university asking question why should university exist why should you be going to a university and if you do go to a university what should you do so that's <clears throat> for tomorrow but um, as I as I said you know my uh, I'm I'm I came into building of institutions very accidentally. And, <clears throat> and then I started liking it. I started liking it. Um, there are moments when you dislike it also. So no, no work is, is, is pleasing all the time. But there are things that you like, the things that you want to do. Um, and I've been very fortunate that I always, um, by chance, I will say, landed up at places which gave me a lot of autonomy and freedom to experiment. And that actually shaped, shaped who I am and that shaped me considerably. <clears throat> and um, so both in terms of in, in the world of academics as well as in, in, in uh, institution building as, as various deans, directors and so on and so forth. Um, but you know, I um, I came into uh, I came into mining by sheer accident. Okay, <laughs> so like all all of you, I never wanted to do engineering. But you know, I'm so glad I did it. <laughs> I'm so delighted and happy. I never wanted to do engineering. I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was 17. And 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 I thought. I just wanted to write. And I had a very wise father who said, Oh, and when you come to a campus like this with the freedom that you get, okay, so um, and away from home, I think who would not like it? You know, and, and this was such a fabulous campus. I have not seen, very honestly, 
around the world such a campus, integrative campus, and a pretty campus like this one. And you don't realize it, but it shapes your thinking. It shapes how you become. Um, the greenery, the, um, the buildings, its colors, its architecture, it actually stays <clears throat> in your mind. So when I, my last book came out, and, and, and uh, so where I was criticizing higher education, and the, um, the cover designer put BHU's picture on top of it. <laughs> so I said, Badi maar padhoge. <clears throat> because, so he said, Aap to BHU se ho, isle likh rahe. Ka, nee, but you have to. So he messed it up. If ever you guys see it, you'll recognize. So he kind of <clears throat> dished out bits and pieces and made it look as if it can be any one. But a keen eye will say, and that's a love. Honestly, <coughs> I have for this institution, uh, and and uh, uh, and I think you learn from everybody. You learn from your teachers. You learn from your your peers. While you are learning, when you are here, you you. I mean, I would I dare to say before a professor, but my attendance must have been very low. So, <coughs> but um, but it. I think it's those large-hearted faculty that made you um, feel very large-hearted. And that's what you carry. Those are values. Values don't get built in the classroom. I can't tell you, but values get lived. <coughs> and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll um, uh, narrate a very interesting incident for you. So when I was in my final year, <coughs> and uh, there was this young man who was ragging. And I was a lot ragging. Thi. <laughs> and, and so there was this young man who had done something very horrendous in his fourth year. And we were, we, I was part of a five-year program. And I was reasonably well. I think my grades were OK, decent. So, um, and, and, uh, so we went to this young man's hostel and said, Ki tumne yaar, he said Kyun kiya? And he was a year junior to us. And he kind of said some things. And after that, <coughs> there was a big show cause notice in my final year that we all get. And there's an inquiry committee that is set up saying, Aapne kya kya kiya bhi to aapko nikala jayega. And this is where, you know, I was, what I was talking about, your large-hearted institutions really leave a mark on you. So there were a panel of professors and there were, we were about five or six of us. And first question is, Tumara GPA kitna hai? Fortunately, all of us had a decent GPA. So, kya hua? So, we narrated what happened. And, and, and you know, they scolded, reprimanded, um, and, and then they went on doing their work. That's what a good institution does to you. And, and, and there are many lessons into it, many lessons on what you should not do many lessons on how <clears throat> when you are at a, um, as a boss, what you should do, or when you are in a power position, what you should do, how do you understand others. These are lessons of life. These are values, very simple values. So um, BHU is a great place. And, and I think you should feel, all of you feel very blessed. Um, it also is a great place because um, you guys, you guys came into an IIT. We always felt we deserved to be in an IIT and never made it. And, and I think for many, that was an angst. But when you reflect around it, when I write my CV, I say BTEC Banaras Hindu University. Because that's a very strong affiliation of an institutional value that you kind of carry. I, I, I mean, I don't put any institute or institution in there. <clears throat> because that's the environment, that's the people I would debate and I would do plays with kids across different schools. And that made, that made who you are. So that's, I think, what, in my mind, made me, um, made me look at things very differently. And many of my friends have done that. I'm not very unique in that sense. Many of my classmates and people senior to me or junior to me um, have charted their own path. 
uh, they were all, all very courageous, brave people. They chased one thing, they chased their dream. And, and the dream, by the way, keeps changing. <coughs> dream is always a dream. <laughs> so, um, but you always, you, you built, built a world around you. Um, what is it that was, my going to US was very accidental. Um, and I actually did more engineering as a PhD student in management than what I had ever done as an undergrad. And, and uh, I, I went, I mean, I, I skipped a master's and straight went into a PhD. <clears throat> and, and I'd worked in manufacturing and think all kinds of things. So um, that's, that's kind of a bit of story. Today, I'm really uh, very privileged to build a new university, a new u research university, which is very unusual. We are actually turning all curriculum on its head, the engineering education, the arts and sciences, and everything else, completely turning on its head. You, if you come to Ahmedabad University, you will not recognize um, that this is an engineering class. And, and the outcomes of kids are very good. They're engaged, they're motivated. Uh, <clears throat> um, they're defining what they want to learn. And, and, and the institution is facilitating them. So that's a very quick intro to just open up a conversation where I'll be very, very interested in listening from you, um, uh, about you, what are your own aspirations, and if there's any questions that I can answer, we're very, very happy to do that. So rather than my going on speaking about this. So my name is Sharin Dupathya. I am a fourth year student of Department of Mining Engineering. So sir, uh, at the starting of your uh, inspirational words, you said it, I, uh, I choose to live the way I am. So uh, how you choose the way, uh, out of many ways, how you choose such a nice way so that you are in front of us and like, how you choose that uh, like nice way? You know, um, I think Things come your way. Um, sometimes you make them also. If you are very aware, um, and if you know yourself, you know you know what you're good at. You know where you can <clears throat> upfront. You didn't. I never knew that I would be a. I wanted to be a VC. That's not what I wanted to do. I actually only wanted to after BTEC only wanted to study OR. Because I was so taken by applied math and, and OR when I was doing undergrad that that's what I wanted to do. And, and I landed up accidentally in a department where I did OR <coughs> an application. And I saw, oh, <coughs> okay, I, I'm learning the method and I'm also applying. <coughs> and that's how my life. So the point is that you, you have to keep asking yourself. <coughs> This is a, really an art of asking yourself, is this what I like? If your, your friends ask you, you know, let's go, go to Lanka. I don't know if you guys still go to Lanka, but our to din, dusra din exam hota tha, to to Lanka jana hi jana hai. <coughs> so um, you, um, you have to ask yourself, do I want to go? And, 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 and if you don't, then you have to build that courage to say, you know what? I want to study, or oh, I want to do something else, or oh, this is not way I, I, I think that's a power that you have to develop within yourself. And it just comes by asking yourself that question, do I like it? Um, sometimes you stay with it because doing the current now leads you to something else in the future. So um, uh, I, I think the game is not to drop it drop things. Um, the game is to do what you're doing so very well that it allows you to do something else that you want to do. <clears throat> That's the game. If, if you, uh, there are many um, um, of my friends who say, you know what, I to civil, I am mechanical, I'm not interested. This heat engine, this IC machine, I don't 
and then you, you, you take yourself off. Um, so the now is very important. You have to live in the now and make that now. Make it the best now for you. And then have that patience that when the time comes, because if you do the now good and very well, I think tomorrow um, many doors will open. And then, you, then only you can make a choice. That's, uh, I mean, I, what I, I, I feel about. And opportunities come <clears throat> in that manner. Uh, sir, I also have another question. Like, how to focus on a single thing? Like, every day we can think about um, many things. Like, new ideas came to our mind. But how to focus, how to stick to a thing that now, uh, Apart from all the ideas, uh, all our thinking, we have to focus on our thinking. <coughs> like how to implement to this thickness to an idea. Um, I don't know if I have an answer for you <coughs> on on that, but you know, um, have you heard of this historian Harari? You all know Harari. I think if you you have, <coughs> if you is a Israeli historian <coughs> who has <coughs> written these books called. Homo Deus, um, Sapiens, and it's just come out with this book called 21 Lesson, Lessons for the 21st Century. <coughs> He's <I'm> not <coughs> catching. Yeah? yeah? OK, thank you. So he, <coughs> other day I was listening to him, and he said something very interesting. <coughs> Somebody asked him this question, so how do you, <coughs> he, he's talking about what is technology going to do to you? <coughs> and so people asked him, um, what should, if you were to give an advice <coughs> to a 17-year-old who is entering university in this day and age, what would you do? <coughs> uh, this was, I think, New York Times <coughs> interviewing him. It's a podcast on YouTube, which you should see. Uh, <coughs> and, and he said, you know, the two things I do, <coughs> I live a very disciplined life. And I could not, I mean, agree with him more. <coughs> um, because what it does is <coughs> it gives you time. What discipline does is it sets in a habit and gives you more time. Because at the end of the day, if you want to do many things, you don't have time, right? <coughs> but if I'm very, very planned and disciplined, I will have time. And second, he said, he said, I don't, want to, um, um, I don't want to propose it for everybody because I know at scale it does not work. But he says, I do meditation for two hours in a day. I can't do it. I don't do it. My mind flitters all over the place. But <clears throat> the, the point is very simple. The point is that um, you are at that age where things are exciting. And you will be. It's very natural to get attracted to many things. And it's not a bad idea to engage with many. But that engagement has to be purposeful. You need to see what is it that you are searching. If you want to do a play, and you want to do that, and you want to learn Python, you guys must all be knowing it very well. But you want to do this, you want to do that. <clears throat> you need to have a reason for doing that. And at some point of time, you say, OK, here is my priority. How many of you keep a calendar on your phone? Yes, all of you? I'm, I'm, I'm so delighted. I'm so delighted. Because it's very important what you do now, very honestly, what you do now is very important. You may feel that. It's not going to be adding up somewhere. But this is the place where it's shaping you very subconsciously. And, and, and I think uh, you'll have to prioritize, let go a few things, do a few things. As you start liking one or two nice things more, you get more into it. But um, uh, I think undergrad education has to be both broad and deep. So you need to build a world view, and you need to you need to have a voice of your own. You know the biggest characteristic that 
at undergrad level you can carry is becoming independent minded. If somebody asks you, oh kanaya ke baare mein kya hai? So you shouldn't tell what Rahul Gandhi says, or you shouldn't tell what Arnab Goswami says. You should say what you think about it. And I think that's what makes you who you are. Sorry for this very long wind. I <clears throat> never knew I could dish out so much of garbage, you know. I can't hear. Can you please stop? Could you keep the mic near you? Yeah. I got this question instantly when you say it's very important for an undergraduate to build an independent personality. So um, throughout the years, there have been and I will throw many preliminary issues. So I would like you uh, to point out on this and emphasize. Uh, is there any measures that we can take to be, become an independent? Because this is a law. Uh, people going through the influences that I have personally. That's, that's where I want to ask. No, it's a very good question. I think <clears throat> it's a very good question. Um, you know, I didn't go about consciously doing it. I'm now reflecting a little bit, <clears throat> but it's not that I sat down at some point of time. I have to be independent minded. Um, <clears throat> but um, so what does independent mindedness truly mean? Independent mindedness means that you have a point of view. And it doesn't mean that you're fighting with someone else with your point of view, but you have a point of view. And, and it's not always that your point of view is correct. It's not always that your point of view is going to be accepted by the other, but you have a point of view. And there's a basis for that point of view. So that's um, I think, and it doesn't come by itself. It comes by introspection. It comes through reading very, very broadly all kinds of people. The more you read, uh, uh, we, the more, um, I mean, your questions and your assumptions get challenged. Every time you read somebody um, who, who challenges your assumption, you start wondering, oh my God, um, am I right? Or you start agreeing with ideologically with somebody who you have despised all your life. Then you say, my God, whatever happened to me? Have I moved in that direction? So all of that happens. <clears throat> but what it does is it tells you what is it that you want to do. And, and I, I was telling Shivam on our way back, we were having great conversation. And um, I really never wanted to be a director of an institution. I wanted to be an academic because I grew up in a family of academics. Both my parents were professors at Allahabad University. Um, my father, for a short while, was actually a professor here at BHU. My father-in-law <laughs> was a professor at psychology. And my mother-in-law studied here. So I, I mean, I, I come from that, and I was very comfortable with it. I like the friends of my parents who would come home. And, and that was the point of time when um, I didn't decide that I have to be academic, but I just started enjoying doing things that I was doing so much that I said, oh, you know what? The next step of while doing PhD is to, to do, um, become an assistant professor. And, <clears throat> and I was in Philadelphia, and I, I applied around and got a job, and, and there I went. And, and I, in the US, um, the system, there's a system of tenure, which means when assistant professor comes in, you remain, unlike India, um, you remain um, temporary, if you may, in the job for six years. So in India, it's about somewhere ranging from one to two years or thereabout at our university. Six years, you work. And then you prepare a dossier, and that goes out to 12 people around the world who evaluate you, and they, you get what is known as a tenure. And tenure is a permanent job. And in North America, there's no retirement age. So I got tenure. And, and right, lo and behold, <clears throat> I decided, you know what? I have to go back to India. And I didn't want to be a bystander. 
anywhere else. I wanted to be doing things. And, and I'm quite entrepreneurial in my mind in that sense. And I said, I have to be in India. And I left. I left tenure. I came back and I walked into the director's office at IIM Ahmedabad. And I said, I'm so and so. So he says, okay, he looks at my CV. I mean, really looking for a job. And, and my wife, who is more qualified than me, she had MD, PhD. Um, she did an MBBS, MD, and then a PhD. Couldn't find a job in India. Those are those times. But she moved back. And then you start to say, okay, what is your purpose? And I want to do, I want to teach, I want to teach well. I want to innovate. I want to do new things. <clears throat> and it's not according to a design, but there is, you're enjoying. When you're enjoying, you are actually doing things. If you're not enjoying, it becomes a chore. So you have to get out when you're not enjoying. And, and that's how one thing led to another. And one day, I, I, I was at IIM Ahmedabad, where I had spent 10 years. And my, one of my professors at Wharton, who had become the dean of the school, called me and he says, oh, you know what, we are building a new school in Hyderabad ISB and we want you to go as an associate dean. And I'm not interested. I'm very happy to. But I went. I said, okay, I've spent so many years at Ahmedabad, let me go spend a year. And I liked it. And I started doing things more institutionally. And then one thing led to another and that's where you land up. I still write. I'm not writing as much as I should be writing, um, but I write, I, 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 and, and I had a book that came out last August. So I, I think if, you, if you're purposeful, you're not wasting time, you know what is it that you want to do, well, life turns out very nice. And you have a positive outlook, that's another one. I'm, I'm a, I'm a dead-end optimist. I think I, I, I have absolutely, I, I mean, I, I, I can't say, I can't take no for an answer. It won't And nine out of ten, or I should say eight out of ten, it will happen. So I think these are personal traits. And you don't plan for it. I, I'm, I'm, the point I'm making is that you don't plan for it. it just comes through your reflection, comes through others who were you with. I, I, I must say I have great friends, people who I've learned a lot, people with whom um, I've worked and done things, developed great friendships over 30, 40 years. Um, and I think each one of them has helped you become who you are. Hey, Nisa, my name is Dhiran Sharma. As you mentioned that you have an academic background of your family and you have started here in BHU and you have taught in the US universities. So what difference did you find in the US universities in terms of dedication of students and commitment and honesty towards their work and where we are lagging, like we are still not in top 100, I mean most of the universities are not in top 100, so where we are lagging. So what we can learn from US while still keeping the originality of our culture and ethos and like we don't want to distort ourselves, but also learn something good and new from them. So I think it's a very long um, story. I, I don't want to get into it. Give me your um, email ID and I'll send you my book. <laughs> okay, I'll send you a copy of my book and, and you can look at the institutional part of it. But to answer you very quickly, um, um, you know, the... Um, Excellence doesn't come with if and but. It doesn't come with a culture. It doesn't come by saying, you know what, this is my culture, I want to retain this, and hence I'm willing to deviate. Um, excellence is truth, uh, or as close as you can get. You know? and, and that's where Mr. Sibyl got it wrong completely when he said shades of truth. They can only be shades of lie. They can never be a shade of truth. And, and education is about truth. Science is about truth. Your search for truth. What is it to you? Um, 
I think many of our cultures have understood it very well, but somewhere we um, collectively, and I'm going to stretch myself, so excuse me, we dislike excellence. We don't like excellence. We are very comfortable with mediocrity. It gives us a face to hide. It gives us, chalo yaar, I mean, ye ho gaya. So I think that um, that's a one big difference that you see um, globally with places um, with with, um, um, with the universities especially. Ranking is a very different game altogether, okay? <clears throat> because ranking has to do with the kind of faculty, the kind of resources that you have. We invest very little in our institutions. Um, higher education barely gets 1.1 or 1.2% of the GDP. Um, Botswana spends 6% on education. Um, and, and I think we, and, and that actually is a reason. If you want to do an interesting experiment or do something else or a faculty member wants to do and have an equipment, there are no resources. You, to get resources, it takes hope. That's one part of it. Second, we are also very easily, we are ready to, as I said, we are ready to accept somebody who is not made excellent. Okay. Whether it's a faculty also, you are a middling guy, but you have done your work, you have done head of the department, so you have done promotion. Ho you are a student, you've been a good student, by and large. Chalo, Aapko aage bada dete I think that bit is, is a challenge for us that, that makes our notions of excellence very, very light. It's a very, very big challenge in India vis-a-vis -vis globally. Um, the third is, um, see, education is founded on trust. If I as a teacher and you as a student we don't trust each other. There can be zero learning. There will be zero learning. There will be no learning at all. Because I'll keep thinking um, very differently. And the trust gets broken very quickly. When I come in late, the test trust gets bo broken. When I cheat as a student, trust gets broken. So I'm going camera, lagayenge, invigilator, lagayenge, all kinds of things I'll start to do. This breaks much of our energy then goes into managing this bureaucracy, which is not needed. If I trust you, you could sit in this exam room without any invigilator, do your exam, give it and go. And if you get five out of 10 questions, then I should be ready to take five out of 10 questions and say, it nahi hame aata hai. I deserve a C or a B, but that's okay. And I, 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 I'll, I'll tell you, um, at Wharton as a PhD student, we had to write a statistics qualifier. Everybody had to um, take these four courses in probability theory and stochastic process and all of that. Everyone at the, irrespective of your, of your world of management. And then write a qualifier. Um, when I wrote my qualifier, the only person who was cheating in that room was an Indian. And you start wondering why. What is the pressure on us to be able to get to a state somewhere that actually I'm not, I'm not reaching? Maybe that's not my state. My state is actually somewhere else. And I think it's, this life is a discovery of this somewhat, something else. And we have to keep moving, keep searching. <clears throat> um, resources, of course, um, play a very, very major role. I mean, if you now you're seeing um, Chinese universities come up very high, they go, they have lots of resources, they'll go hire faculty globally, they'll give them money to come and study and, and, and they'll give them money to set up labs and do all kinds of things. And they start getting PhD. So I'm never worried about ranking. I, I mean, I don't even now open those rankings. It doesn't matter. But what matters is, am I excellent? Am I seeking excellence? And I, and I think that's 
a very major lacuna somewhere <coughs> amongst us. I, I don't know why I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss, but mm, there must be something cultural, there must be something competition-wise, there must be, I don't know what. Why would I aspire to get into a job or somewhere else if I don't? I'll go wherever I go. Life is not And I'll tell you one thing. <clears throat> so I have to tell you this story. So I, I think I, was, I did fairly well in my undergrad. Okay. My, I may have been second or third in my class. But I was the only one who didn't get a job from campus. I didn't get a job. <clears throat> I had applied to do masters in OR. <clears throat> And I got admission at all great places, MIT and Columbia, but no financial aid. <clears throat> and, and, and then Professor Bibi Dhar one day asked me, Kya kar rahe ho? So I said, Oh, Ingersoll Rand ne nokri diya hai, ICI ne nokri diya hai. And this is post a, a month or two after I left BHU. Um, I was doing interviews with them. <clears throat> ICI was a very big company at that point of time. Um, so, I thought that we will go there. He said, you will go to Alaska. So, I, and, 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 I mean, I didn't even think for 30 seconds. What thought came to my mind was, oh, no one to Alaska. And I said, yes, Alaska will go. And I went to Alaska. And it was a third rate university, I'll tell you. VHU was far, far superior. You know, we got everybody, I mean, there was a guy from IIT Kharagpur there, there's a guy from ISM Dhanbad, um, and this was a, <clears throat> I was with one of my former actually alumni of, of our department, Sukumar Bandupadhyay, and, and, and uh, everybody was getting 4.0. And then I get a, I mean, incidentally, I had also applied for a PhD program at Wharton. And I got my letter and financial aid much less, much after I had left for Alaska. I mean, look at how, how life takes you one place to another. And I, I, I left for Alaska in August. I get this letter redirected from my parents' home in October. And the session has already started in September. I so I don't know what ran in my mind. I called this guy who had signed the letter and I said, I'm so and so and I've just finished a term here in December, I may have called him. And I got this letter very late. He said, Yo, we gave you financial aid, but you never came. And then he asked me, do you want to come now? So I said, yes. So I went away from there to, to, to do my PhD at Wharton. So life is is that it's it's never i don't know what would have happened if i had just stayed at at uh, uh, alaska or what would have happened i if i had gone to one of the ims where i had written the exam and gotten in god knows what what would have happened <clears throat> so um i i think this is we have to take what you get with both the hands and you have to run it, run with it so fast. And with so much of energy, with so much of effort, that the next guy says, watches you and says, my God, you know what? This is my guy. It's been there in my mind for quite some. What matters most for me today is to really um, completely change higher education in India. 
I think that's uh, um, so I I I went to I'm Bangalore and that's another long story I won't bore you with that but um, um, I got a second term as a director but I was so bored with I am Bangalore I was so bored and I, I thought to myself um, if I stay back five years um, it would be 11 and a half years that I would give to this institution. Am I willing to do that? And the answer in my heart was no. So I turned it down. And, and I, um, I went away and wrote a book for a year. Some friends helped me and lots of people have helped you all the way along. That's another thing, you know, if you, you're running, um, there's so many people who come and help you that you will not even know kaha se madad aa rahi hai and and I, I i went away for a year at to chicago at university of chicago and i spent and finished a book and then i came back to um ahmedabad uh, and that I, I actually followed my wife who took up a job in ahmedabad they said okay i have made you move around a lot now it's my time to move and we landed up and I was wondering what should I do? And this churn was happening. I had seen I am Ahmedabad and I felt this is bad education. I had seen I am Bangalore and I felt this is even bad education. I had seen IITs and I would never want to go there. It kept, <laughs> I'm sorry, but it kept telling me, and, 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 and I think uh, I was very, very fortunate um, to become part of Yashpal committee. This was a committee that was set up to look at higher education and close down UGC, by the way. And, um, and I, I think they've just picked me because they must have wanted one IM director from somewhere. But I, again, made the most of it. And uh, we visited 30 universities from Nagaland down to uh, Trivandrum. And, and I really saw how bright our young kids are, how wide-eyed and, and good they are and how bad our universities were. And that really drove me to write that book. I mean, it was, it was bothering me no end. And, and when, um, when the chairman of Ahmedabad University, um, who is uh, chairman of Arvind Mills, Sanjay Lal Bhai, asked me, why don't you come and <clears throat> lead this university? Um, I thought about it, and I really took it with both the hands with a very strong feeling that it's a privilege. Um, actually, they were doing me a lot of favor by giving me that opportunity to build an institution at Ahmedabad University. And we are actually building it very differently, inside out. Uh, <clears throat> we, in engineering school, uh, we increasingly um, doing project-based learning and experiential learning. Kids do things by their hand. The classes look so very different. We used to have a course in acoustics um, and, and sound and acoustics, and we threw it out and instead replaced it with a course called the Science of Building Musical Instruments. And everybody builds, whoever takes that course builds three musical instruments and actually does all the computations of, of uh, of physics and sound and, and applies it onto it. Um, and and I, I see kids who, in a classroom after the 10th minute or the third row of a lecture, it's all distant education. Mind is somewhere else, uh, <clears throat> somewhere far away. At least mine used to be. But here kids come at 7 in the morning and want to stay till 8 in the night doing things. And they are reading theory. And they are doing things. So I'm, my, I'm, I'm 24 by 7. I wish I had 48 hours in a day. 24 by 7, thinking about how do I change learning in the classroom and governance in an academic institution. Well, that's another very major problem in most of our institution to the question that you are asking. Um, governance is a very, very major problem. So um, that's what, and, and my hope is, this is my big dream, that can I create an exemplar in higher education that can then be copied by everybody.
That's my. As most of the mining engineers, uh, people who do not take mining engineers, they follow a roughly a very rough trajectory. Uh, it takes them to several places, including other big adventures and uh, things in other branches. Of the so I had the same. Uh, right. So I landed up as a faculty here six months back, which I didn't want to take a full-time uh, faculty position in my whole life. I, I <laughs> went through other programs. So it's also a new experience to me. So here uh, we are celebrating our 100 years of existence, as you already know. So uh, we, are, uh, we have started brainstorming on uh, how do we articulate our vision for next 100 years. Right. So if uh, you are in such a position as the Supreme, so what would be your suggestion that what are the things that we should look for in the next 100 years? And uh, I am uh, just uh, what would have your opinion on the macro level that 100 years we have done this. Now next right. 100 years what we should be doing. Right. I'm talking a little bit about it tomorrow. Yeah. <clears throat> but nevertheless, let me answer. Um, um, I think I... Uh, but that's all right. Um, um, I don't think um, many of you, I mean, I have been post my VTech, been in the same industry practically. You've been all over Puneet. I have been in the same industry, which is largely education. Did PhD, became assistant professor, got tenure, came back and taught, became director. I mean, I, I've had a very, very, <clears throat> very, very narrow kind of a, of a life in that sense. But I've changed seven jobs. I have a feeling um, in 100 years, you will have to change seven in the industries. Because you will, um, many of the industries will not exist. And they're already starting to happen for a variety of reasons. There are very many reasons. I mean, it's not technology alone. <clears throat> there are many, many reasons. Um, and, and consequently, I mean, imagine for a moment, and, and imagine with me, suppose um, we, get, uh, we get a breakthrough at BHU in, um, in storage battery. We have, um, and suppose we get a um, breakthrough over the next 100 years in or 25 years on, 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 on solar films, and I reduce that cost very dramatically. Actually, petroleum goes out of business completely. I have solar, I have automobile, I have battery, I have electronics. I mean, imagine, I mean, the world of petroleum, I mean, today uh, uh, um, uh, crude oil is running at, what, 80, 81 dollars a barrel. <clears throat> I think it will run at zero. And so, um, so and, and you, can, you can speculate, and of course, um, these are all forecasts, and forecasts are always wrong. <laughs> Um, but um, you will you will see many sectors changing. Now, for you, um, you have to think. So, what do I learn? What do I train myself? You'll have to retrain many times in very different ways. People are already doing that today. Um, and um, and I think academic institutions have to play a very singular role in this retooling on the, on the teaching learning side, on this retooling, because people are going to come back. Um, many of my, by the way, classmates who went to IMs um, at age 50 lost their jobs because the, uh, by 47, 46, the, of maybe mid 40, they were all CEOs. They were making a lot of money. <clears throat> by 50, the, the, the median life of a CEO is about two and a half years globally. In India, it's maybe three years, three and a half. Um, and then you can go down to another level of, of a company, maybe another two years, maybe five, six years across multiple companies. Um, and they, they were all are out. And it's not one, it's not two. <clears throat> so the question is, 
um, the, ch the challenge for academic institutions to remain relevant is very, very, very high. That world of learning engineering science as we all did and perhaps you are still doing it, I think is over. The world is one of doing and, and, and learning to do, learning, <clears throat> um, learning to apply, all of that, they are very different skills that are needed and actually educational institutions today, not only in India, Puneet, but globally, are struggling. The, it's a global phenomenon, it's not India. Um, in fact, uh, just like telecom, maybe some Indian institutions may be able to bypass and create a revolution ahead of the American ones because we are, we are not there today. We don't have a baggage. But um, I think it is very important to think constantly you, what you will learn um, in, uh, in your final year or your four years here will probably last you another four or five years. How do you see, uh, mining never changed. Mining and petrology are still there, the same department, the same, like nothing was carved out of them or they were uh, reconfigured like School of Material Sciences has emerged and all of those schools. So next hundred years, how do you see that this economy is changing? I think this, yeah, it's a very good question, Puni. I think this, this, this is going to be a, a consolidation of phenomenon and consolidation not by disciplines but consolidation by by problem types. So you are already seeing mobility as a top challenge globally and in India you recently had a, a very big mobility conference that Niti Aayog did in Delhi. Now what does mobility involve? Mobility involves uh, transportation, mobility involves logistics, mobility involves materials, new materials, mobility involves computers and electronics, mobility involves, um, um, okay, exactly. So the question is, we are, I think this, these are, um, these are demarcations done by academics. Because I became narrow and narrow and narrow in terms of my own depth and publication and I kind of ignored this world around me and truly became irrelevant. So there is already starting to happen. <clears throat> the world over, I mean, if you see, um, I mean, a good example is cognitive science departments, right? That are bringing in neuroscience, psychology, electrical engineering, and few others together. Uh, you are seeing um, engineering bio and biology coming together in very, very big way. Uh, med tech is a classic example. And what is med tech? It is largely fabrication, new materials and it is understand and electronics. <clears throat> so um, there is, I think, a very strong, that's also where opportunity is going to lie. That's also where jobs are going to lie. That's also where, where innovation <clears throat> will happen. Um, other day, um, I mean, I was really taken aback. So I, um, after a very long time, and I'm reaching an age where I should get myself tested every frequently, so I went and got myself tested, I did all kinds of tests, and my blood sugar kind of a little bit fluctuated. And I have no history of blood sugar problem, no pain, nothing, <clears throat> and, and I don't feel it. So the uh, doctor said, you know what, I don't want to give you any medicine, but why don't you just monitor it? So I said, all right, it's okay, I'll monitor. And he, he prescribed a device to me which I stuck it at the back of my arm. It's a, this big electronic device and with a needle. And <clears throat> I took it and just shoved it into my arm. And there was this, uh, it w went into the bloodstream. And every 15 minutes, it is actually pulling data. And <clears throat> it is, uh, um, uh, it's actually pulling blood sample and, and storing data on what is the extent of blood sugar. And I, every day, take a device, put it next to it, and it reads it. And it tells me, over 24 hour period, every 15 minutes, what is happening. This is the world. This is, and, and I mean, today it's expensive. 
but I bet you that in five years of time, this is going to be dirt cheap. And we must do that. We must do it because we have the market. So it's a, I, I think that world of interdisciplinarity, that world of multiple disciplines, um, when I was writing my book, actually, um, I came to BHU and went to the library because I wanted to hear what was happening at the time when BHU was getting formed. And I got to see a prospectus of 1929. And that prospectus was very interesting. It said, every undergrad student will take a course in geology, in medicine. I mean, they used a very different term, oriental medicine. They'll take a course in philosophy. They'll take a course here, and so on and so forth. That's the building of the, of the broad mind, to be able to, to cross boundaries. That's to be able to say, OK, you know what? Um, I'm a material scientist. I, uh, I'm working with you, you, Mr. Electronics Engineer. You know electronics. And, and I think it's, a, um, and it's, it's starting to happen in a very, very big way. Departments are re being recast. They're very different departments. The degrees are getting recast. Um, sooner than later, it will happen to us. In fact, organization, the biggest change that's happening in organization, um, somebody, <clears throat> one of the CEOs of one of the largest companies in India, um, I used to go meet with him. And every time I met him, he would ask me, Nya kya hai? Kya tumhare dimag mein nya chal hai? So once or twice I blurted out, then I realized, my God, every time this is an inquisition, so I better think and, and go, ki ye kya, uh, what is new happening around what I'm reading and what I'm hearing. <clears throat> so one, one day I said to him that, you know what? Um, I think the organization is going to change very dramatically. So he asked me that, uh, uh, he says, I'm, I was also thinking, tell me, why should I even have employees? I was going to tell this, narrate this tomorrow, but I'll tell you <coughs> for benefit of Puneet. But he said, why should I have employees? I want to work, develop this new product. The plastic developer is sitting as an expert in Korea. The label guy is in France. Uh, the, um, the extrusion machine guy is in Germany. Um, I'll actually call them for a project for a 20-day period or one month or six months or one year or three years. Finish this project, new product, and they disband. And I'll then start to reform. And, uh, um, and that's truly what's happening in some ways in the world. And then I asked this question, so what would you, jab aap AGM karenge, to kis employee ko address karenge? Aaj aap loyalty ki baat kar rahe hain in organization, what would loyalty mean? What would promotion mean in an organization where people are coming, forming, disbanding, going away? So the world is changing very, very dramatically, more, more faster than what we can think of. And, and we, it's happening much more globally because the pressures of cost is very high of the manpower cost globally, but it's all coming on to us. Very strongly it's coming on to us. And we need to be very aware, institutions need to be aware, we need to develop programs, build mindsets among students that are very flexible, where emotional intelligence is very, very high, where emotional resilience is very, very high, because um, you will go through. Losing a job is, by the way, not very easy. Very easy at all. Um, but people develop that resilience to manage it. Um, the biggest killer in the world um, is because of mental health reasons. So um, I, I, I don't want to paint a very bad world. That's not the point I'm making. I want to paint a world that the world is changing. And we need to drive that change. We need to be plugged into, and institutions 
have a responsibility and, and institutions do not change fast enough, they change very slowly and, and, and that is a challenge. Sir, my, name is my question is more from an academic point of view. So, after you became a mining engineering, you went for a PhD in physical science. It was a completely different field. So, apart from the great GP or some of the great decent score in GRE or GMAT, <laughs> what else did you do in your undergrad which helped you uh, get the PhD, admission and optimism? You know, um, <laughs> PhD and I was I was absolutely completely into extracurricular. I represented the BHU debating team and we, we won all over the country. I was part of the drama club and literary association and all of that and I used to do a lot. But I think those just don't matter for PhD. They only two things matter. Um, when you're looking when they're looking for PhD, they look, are you academically good? to be able to go through their program. And, and you go through, you show them grades. And it's not as if you have to have a 3.9 GPA out of 4. But the courses that matter, you should have done well. So I went, I, um, went to decision sciences. The department was called decision sciences. But it had information systems, operations research, operations management, and decision theory which is largely behavioral economics. So that was the very eclectic group of people. And, and in OR, um, I had just done one course in OR. It didn't matter, very honestly. Um, but uh, um, uh, they looked at math grades. They looked at things of that particular kind and said, and then I had a very, very decent GRE score. So wherever, wherever it was a little bit down somewhere, I think it, GRE made it up. And, so that's it. I, I mean, and I, and and I, um, I made one mistake. I should have worked before going for PhD. And I always felt when I landed in PhD, I had a class of eleven students, and there were people who were masters in electrical engineering from MIT. Somebody was a <coughs> Stanford undergrad. Somebody was somewhere else. And I felt, you know what? I'm just an undergrad struggling to kind of, of, of do well, and at least for the first couple of years. Um, and, and many of my other colleagues who had worked for one or two years actually knew why they wanted to do PhD. Um, they had problems from industry very clearly at the back of the mind. I didn't have. Uh, and, and I think it's for if somebody is looking to go to PhD, very good idea. And in business school, they like it also. They like it. They like if you, um, so in engineering too, <clears throat> I mean, they like it if you work, because then you can relate to real problems. You can understand why things are happening, what's a challenge. You can speak that language, which I, going as an undergrad, um, I didn't didn't have. Good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Mohammad Anis and I'm a student of Peter Petroli uh, from Graphic University. Uh, so as you told, like, uh, for I did, I yourself, was the last question you said, like, uh, who are you? Uh, suppose, uh, so, if I have a goal, okay, so achieving that goal, you have a spending piece and everything, and finally you have, like, failed on that goal, you didn't care. Then on that time, how did you manage? You know, um, eight out of ten times, you will not make it. But what matters is that one time, you, sh you just to have the perseverance to keep going. Um, somebody said very nicely, I was, uh, I was listening to a talk, and somebody said, um, the problem is not that people fail or do badly. The problem is that people give up when they fail and do badly. And I kind of, it stuck with me. I mean, I, I, I thought there was so much of wisdom in it. Now the question, next question, if I were you, I would ask this question. So what capability should I build in myself to be tenacious enough to keep trying? You, you will fail. You will slip. There are many times you will try and you will not get. I told you I never got a job. 
And, and I had, I mean, people with much, much poor GPA got a job. Maybe for whatever reason, maybe I was very arrogant in those interviews. Maybe they felt that this guy is useless, he doesn't know anything. Or maybe they felt he's not going to join, whatever it was. But, and it, it does, you feel bad. That's not the point. You will feel bad. I mean, all of us, when, when you're aspiring, you're trying, and it doesn't happen. But the thing is to just shed it and say, chalo, next kya hai? All right. Wo girne nahi dene hai apne aapko. Kisi tarah se girne nahi dena ka hai. Kyunki gir gaye to phir wo himmat haar gaye. Himmat nahi haar nahi hai. Thik hai. Ye nahi hua. And you know, I've seen lots and lots of people who'll, who'll say, okay, I'm going to do this. Main char saal IAS likh raha hoon. Nahi hua. अब स्टेट प्रोविंशियल सर्विस में चले गए वहाँ पे पहुँचा तो देखा तो वहाँ पे तो बहुत घटिया किस्म के लोग हैं यू आर यूज्ड टू सर्टेन काइंड ऑफ एन एम्बियंस एंड अदर थिंग्स क्या अरे बाप रे कहाँ पे हम फंस गए आके अभी जिंदगी तबाह हो गई दैट्स वन वे ऑफ लुकिंग एट इट नदर वे ऑफ लुकिंग एट इट ओके नाओ आई एम गोइंग टू वर्क टू सी यहाँ से कैसे बाहर भागना है हाउ डू आई मेक माई नेक्स्ट स्टेप ठीक है आई हैव टू वर्क वेरी हार्ड यर बिकॉज दैट्स टू डे आई हैव लैंडेड अप हेयर so i'll do this i'll write i'll work so hard that somebody notices me and says you know what this guy and i'll i'll keep looking at him you know what is there in me which is causing this kind of a am i not communicating very well am i not reading thing am i not telling people um, properly do i not know things very well uh, sometimes there are things which are outside your control so i i think you have to have perseverance and that's one second also always keep telling you and and this is um, i keep telling myself all the time um so ek bar wo akbar aur birbal ki story thi to unhone bheja birbal ko ki you guys may have some of you may have read it also ki aisi cheez khoj ke lao jo ki jo khush hai wo na khush ho jaye jo na khush hai wo khush ho jaye right you heard that and and if you not heard you know so this guy goes jis din samay tha wo birbal hai akbar hai kya hai wo to malum nahi but jo saab the unhone kaha khoj ke ek faqir ke paas pahunche aur kaha ki saab batao iska kya raaz hai to usne unhe anguthi de di to ja ke unhone dekha aur nawab saab ko ya akbar ko kis de diya usne likha tha this too shall pass good things will pass and bad things will pass <clears throat> and it gives you so much of comfort to go through tough difficult situations sometimes it's family say sometimes it's others sometimes you face situations say okay okay i have to somehow if i get out of this i'll be okay that's life <laughs> Greetings, sir. Uh, I am Danishman uh, from Fortier Mining Engineering, Indus Valley Institute. Uh, pardon me for a very long question. I am going to ask. I think it's wrong. <laughs> I might, I, 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 I might, might not, not answer, answer it. it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have seen that uh, you did your PhD in decision sciences, and uh, in a later stage, have been very uh, active in policy making. Such as uh, monitoring the function of the institutions through a survey you have been conducting over the past 20 years and working in various cabinet and sub cabinet committees and sub committees uh, and building up an institution and basically this is all uh, policy making in education sector. Uh, similarly, uh, I have an aim of working in public policy and governance, uh, but at the same time uh, I have a deep desire to do some research in my field. Uh, and have some uh, satisfaction that uh, I have worked in my field, uh, I have done justice to it. Uh, so uh, for this I want to do a uh, PhD. Uh, my idea is that uh, with the knowledge I can gain through my PhD, uh, I could work better uh, in decision making and uh, related uh, field of governance and public policy. So uh, can you 
give me your view on this uh, as to is this a prudent idea or is it just uh, idea, too idealistic? No, I mean, it's not idealistic. <laughs> um, you have to you have to execute it according to a plan <clears throat> and. Uh, there are many, many ways, if your ultimate goal is to work in public policy, there are many goals, um, many ways to do it. First and foremost, public policy in which domain? Right, you could be in, um, <clears throat> you could be in, in international affairs, so you could do um, education, or you could do manufacturing policy, or you could do mining policy, you could do whatever. There are broad um, domains. Um, and um, there are people who do masters in public policy, MPP, um, both in India and, and globally, um, after their bachelors, and, and then they come back into doing, um, um, working with government and doing public policy. Remember one thing, um, you don't make public policy. Public policy gets made. You are... Um, um, you, you start by providing input and building an understanding of how public policy is made. And at some point of time, once you keep doing, <clears throat> you reach a stage whereby you say you are you're part of that committee that is designing policies. Uh, now, um, two things you could do. You could continue in your field. Yeah, and continue in your field, get enough experience, get the maturity that you need uh, without sacrificing your, your long-term vision. And, and once you have that understanding of that broader domain, I just have a um, young person who wrote to me actually um, who finished his thesis at Harvard on coal industry. And he is uh, he's a uh, historian come political scientist. And he's, <clears throat> he's applied for a faculty position. And when he was wanting to do his field work in India, he had come by and we'd connected him with all the friends from BHU in the coal fields. And, and he did his work. That's also public, public policy. You can become, a, if you do a PhD, you can become an academic in public policy. If you um, do a master's, you can become a practitioner of public policy. So, um, but most important, with public policy, it's very important that you have work experience, that you understand the domain for which you want to make policy, inside out. If you do that, I think uh, you can then go do a master's or a PhD. Thank you. Next and uh, guys, we have about only 10 minutes, so... Uh, Let's, yeah, so keep your questions ready and maybe we'll take one or two questions, I guess, sir. No, no, I'm okay. I mean, really, uh -huh. so I'll, exhaust, I'll exhaust your questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, my name is Mahathir Chaudhary and sir, my question is that as you, as you were talking about the thing that uh, in India, uh, we are uh, researching about the higher studies, higher studies, the way higher studies is going in India. So, so my question is like uh, what we are having right now, we are having uh, the thing is that we work, we start on it, we have our working hours in, on, uh, in, in day and night, we just sleep, we rest. So is it is it uh, decreasing or is it decreasing our intelligence is affecting our way of way to be perceive things, like way to be how to be learn things, like if we start working overnight and take rest, like start taking rest. In days, so can we be more efficient? Like this may be a thing to, be, uh, to develop or uh, develop a new way how human can interact or human can learn things. आप जरूर mining industry में जाइए. Oh, आपको रात में भी काम करवाएंगे shift में. No, I am very honestly. I'm not, I'm not making facetious of your question. Um, I don't know. <clears throat> I think I'm sure there are psychologists and neuroscientists who would be able to answer that question a little bit better um, in terms of what happens to our brains um, and our ability to think. Some, um, I'm a morning person. I've never been able to, I was because the notes, the topper notes, I was able to get the exam. 
सो 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 रात भर सब लोग करते थे तो मुझे सवेरे ही उठना पड़ता था आई एम अ वेरी कंप्लीट मॉर्निंग पर्सन आई स्टिल गेट अप एट फोर इन द मॉर्निंग एंड for about 50 to 60% 50% of the stuff you can work through the entire night and do interesting things um and but you know um institutions and organizations and organizations are very different because um you don't work by yourself if you are self employed you can do whatever you want but if you have to work with others um then unfortunately organizationally you will have to come at times where others are also available same is the case with the university as an organization that if the class has to be held um uh, you can say you know many of the classes should not be held um it's all assignments i do it i solve some things you can do it but not all so um there is as an autonomous entity i can do what i want to do but as a collective i have to then define the rules of the collective which will probably make you sleep in the night i know i agree i mean i mean some people really work very well in the night and they are very fresh and good but you sir has the question maybe you can yeah anyone else sir i had sir, mat jao school savere <laughs> so aap kal puchhega sir let the students interact sir nahi nahi you know it's a it's a very good and very important question that you, <coughs> that you are asking it's a very important question um the um the problem in the country's education system is <coughs> that it is very strongly controlled by governments and control happens by only if you standardize everything okay <clears throat> because imagine for a moment i am the secretary um of education in a state and i have 300 colleges and universities or 10000 schools um and i want to control what will i do how can i control if they are all very different so i'll say everybody writes an entrance exam everybody writes a class 6 level exam everybody does exactly the same books everybody uh, and 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 i think that standardization is really killing education killing learning because i can never i mean all of us can't do very well with the same standard exam you will do very well i might just flunk but if you give me a very different kind of an exam or maybe different kind of different time where maybe different environment i'll probably do as well so um this is a challenge which has which the government will never be able to solve it has not been able to solve anywhere else in the world it has to be solved individually at every institution every institution will have to solve it and and those that are enlightened will actually do it those that are smart will copy the enlightened and do it those that are stupid will continue to teach to examination and not teach to learning which is exactly what happens in our schools i mean i mean it is appalling that in class 12 kids are asked ki underlying keywords in your question because the examiner might at least see and say ha isne to panch shabd theek se likh diye hain and i'll give you the marks i think that's a tragedy of our nation complete tragedy and it and nothing will work if we don't decentralize which means that the you know the government has to get out of education completely get out of it i think uh, you 
I think the time has come when we, today we may not be rigorous when we bring them together, but tomorrow we would be, because we would have understood how these various disciplines and parts come together. And we will then with that build the edifice. And, and so it is just a matter of time. I agree. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for a very inspiring interaction with the students. So let's give him a big hand.